welcome to the third class on chromatography. In the previous uh, discussions, we have uh, we have studied about the chromatographic techniques in general, and then gas chromatographic instrumentation, uh, followed by a discussion on the columns, and now we will continue our discussion on the detectors. Now. If you remember the uh, slides, uh, what I had shown in the last class, that is uh, regarding the <coughs> gas chromatography. You can see in the slide that we have a detector attached to the end of the column, and this detector senses the arrival of the systems and uh, <coughs> we would like to continue our discussions on uh, what, what are the different types of discussions, uh, detectors, we are going to need them. So, in general, the detectors sense the arrival of the separated components and provide a signal. They these are either concentration dependent or mass dependent. That means, as the concentration of the gas carrier gas changes, when the separated component enters the detector, the concentration will change and the concentration will increase to a maximum and then it will slowly decrease. So, it is either a concentration dependent or it can be mass dependent, because when we use hydrogen or helium gas any component that we are trying to separate would be heavier than hydrogen or uh, helium or even nitrogen for that matter, if you are using nitrogen as a carrier gas. Therefore, the uh, detector can be mass dependent also. So, all the detectors in general are characterized by what is the minimum and maximum range, what is the optimum range through which the sample can be analyzed. This is known as linear dynamic range LDR. So, uh, the actually LDR also represents largest signal divided by the smallest signal. Therefore, signal to noise ratio should be approximately 2 for the smallest signal. Therefore, the detector should be close to the column exit and the correct temperature also must be maintained to prevent decomposition. So, if you take a look at the next slide, we are going to discuss about uh, the thermal conductivity detector. Actually, it consists of just four heating elements located in a heating cavity of brass or steel block, which serves as a heat sink. Thermistors or resistance wires are used with platinum iridium springs and filaments are gold sheathed um, in a gold um, uh, cavity uh, the tube and um, the filaments are gold sheathed tungsten or teflon coated tungsten also you can use with high temperature coefficient of resistance. The cell cavity that actual cavity in which the sample enters is approximately 2.5 ml for large thermal conductivity detectors or 0 0.025 milliliter for micro TCDs that is 0 0.025 milliliters for micro TCDs. So, the total volume could be maximum 5 ml of the whole TCD. Therefore, the system is very simple like this that uh, as, as I told you these are different resistance wires and then there is a galvanometer and uh, there is a resistance and uh, um, one amperometer 
and then an emitter and this is the power supply. So, whenever there is a balance that means, when the sample is not coming all the four arms of the TCD are balanced. Therefore, the there will not be any signal the moment sample comes in there will be imbalance in two parts and uh, uh, the different uh, remaining references will remain same because there is no sample in that. So, this imbalance is recorded as a signal it is a very simple and straightforward concept and very useful also for the general materials that means, it is not chemical specific detector it is a general detector any substance that you are trying to separate will is going to give you a signal because the when the sample enters the detector uh, that uh, filament signal it, it the, its job is just to cool the temperature uh, the wire temperature of the wire. So, thermal conductivity of the carrier gas and sample plus mixture is what we usually measure. The TCD cells are connected to form the arms of a Wheatstone bridge as I showed you here uh, like this the Wheatstone bridge arms and um, when pure gas passes both reference and sample wires are cooled to the same extent that means, only when the carrier gas is being passed through they will be cooled to the same extent. When the solute emerges out of the column and enters the detector the rate of cooling in the sample changes and the Wheatstone bridge is out of balance this is recorded as a peak. Both helium and hydrogen are useful as carrier gases whenever you are using thermal conductivity detectors since because their uh, thermal conductivities of hydrogen and helium are much different from the sample components that is why it is known as a uh, common detector irrespective of the nature of the chemical species that you are trying to separate. Now, I want to discuss with you about the gas density detector. Gas density detector actually is a very simple arrangement like this that uh, uh, you can see the in this figure the size of the detector is approximately just 100 mm that is 10 centimeter and uh, the reference gas enters like this. And then this is a solid block as therefore, the reference gas has can take bar can take the path either like this and then go goes out or it can take a path like this and then go here and then comes out. The chromatographic uh, gas the chromatographed components will enter through this block and they have a they can also enter through this and go up like this and come out mix with the carrier gas here or it can come down and go here. Therefore, what is happening in this case is both the carrier gas and the sample gas are coming out and getting mixed. So, the uh, they are split basically into two streams the where the the cooling is monitored two flow meters we have shown that is uh, uh, B 1 and B 2 in the previous slide they are installed into the stream and are wired again in a Wheatstone bridge. The reference gas enters the reference gas enters at A and then it is passing through a B and D, I call it D A B D or it can come like this A and then B 2 D A B 1 D and A B 2 D both possible both possibilities are there and I have a flow meter B 1 and B 2 here. So, 
when I have the reference gas, it splits into two and exits at the point D. The effluent enters at C, again splits again into two mixes and mixes with the carrier gas and uh, exits at D. The effluent does not come into contact with the detector element and hence there is no con contamination and no carbonization but it takes the path it can take either a b 1 d or a b 2 d that is one from the top or one from the bottom that is uh, only two paths are there. So, but it generally whenever carrier gas enters it will take the path from the bottom preferably because any of the chromatographic component you want to separate is heavier than the carrier gas. So, it will take the uh, path A B 2 D with a temperature rise in B 2 and decreases in the temperature of B 1 that is A B 1 D and uh, the detector it goes either preferentially A B 2 D like this instead of A B 1 D. So, this is the basic principle of uh, uh, the gas density detector. Again, I have to emphasize that it is a universal detector. So, the bridge imbalance when the sample enters is recorded as a signal. The detector accommodates a sample volume of maximum 5 ml and uh, 5 ml sample uh, uh, there is a, um, operating at temperatures of about 100 to 300 degree centigrade we can operate it. Now, I want to talk to you about another detector that is flame ionization detector. This is slightly more complicated and I am showing you a schematic diagram of the FID that is flame ionization detector. Here what I have is this is the O1 wall and then this is the exit end of the column. It is connected directly to a tube and um, there is a hydrogen entering a stream of hydrogen is entering into this tube and mixes with the sample and here it is lighted to make the hydrogen air flame. And then we have other paraphernalia like this uh, insulator, there is an air inlet and collector assembly unit, etcetera. And here, the um, when the flame is ionized, I have a collector here, one is a removable collector, and there is this is a collector holder and flame FID flame ionization detector. The basically the whole idea is to put a uh, to put a uh, wire in which the sample ionizes and the wire will collect the ions and then generate some amount of current. Therefore, the column effluent enters the FID after a particulate filter, we do not need the particulates in that. It is a very important component of a flame ionization detector. So, other aspects include hydrogen and air mixture to be burnt to obtain a plasma of about 2100 degree centigrade, which has sufficient energy to ionize any of the organic solute passing through that. The ions are collected at the anode and electrons are connected at the cathode. The resulting ionic current is usually monitored by measuring the voltage drop across a series of resistors up to 300 volts and then the resistors are of the order of about 10 raise to 7 to 10 raise to 10 ohms and uh, currents as low as 10 raise to minus 14 amperes can be monitored. That means, this is going to be this is a very very sensitive detector 
as far as gas chromatographic um, detectors are concerned. The only requirement in this case is the material should burn, but the separated sample component must burn giving you a large number of ions and electrons at the plasma temperature of about 2100 degree centigrade. When the solute is burnt, basically a large increase in the electrical conductivity is seen due to the number of carbon atoms. The detector is usually insensitive to water. Permanent gases do not generate any ions and uh, inorganic components usually do not. Carbon monoxide no, carbon dioxide no because they cannot generate the ions and it therefore, it is useful for organic compounds contained in aqueous uh, solutions also and it is useful for air pollution studies. But uh, current decreases usually for substituted amines, halogens, OH groups etcetera. The linear dynamic range that is the ratio of the largest signal divided by the ratio of the smallest signal is about 10 raised to 6. Therefore, the FID is a very good detector and again a general detector for organic compounds except the things what I have mentioned here that is water CO, CO2 and uh, permanent inorganic gases, permanent gases etcetera and uh, the current also decreases because if there are amines etcetera. A sample splitter is therefore, necessary in using AFID. Precise temperature control is not a rigid requirement because when you are attaining temperatures of about 2100 to 2200 degrees, it does not make much sense in maintaining the temperature exactly around that temperature. FID is in general insensitive to water permanent gases such as CO, CO2, carbon disulfide, sulfur, di uh, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, nitrous oxide, nitrogen oxides, nitrogen dioxide, silicon tetrafluoride, silicon tetrachloride etcetera. Therefore, it is advantageous in moist air samples for the analysis of organic components. That is why I was trying to tell you that it is good for the uh, air pollution studies because permanent gases do not give you any signal. So, any organic compounds that are present in the air, they can be absorbed or taken up in aqueous solutions and then pass through the GC and uh, they will give you a signal. Carbon monoxide and carbon CH2 are some of the components. They get converted to carbon methane in general if you pass it over a nickel catalyst placed somewhere on the in the way in uh, FID and the sensitivity of uh, such determination is 5 nanograms per second. For uh, higher organic uh, gases, the sensitivity is 10 picograms per second. The 10 picograms per second is a fantastic uh, sensitivity. The linear dynamic range for uh, uh, FID is about 10 raised to 7 that makes it one of the best detector available in the gas chromatography. Therefore, usually 99 percent of the gas chromatographic uh, equipments will have TCD or FID thermal conductivity detector for general separation of the components of general character and FID for organic uh, substances. Now, we can discuss a little about phosphorus detector. Basically, a 
phosphorus detector is a modified flame ionization detector. Only the difference is that the tip is being made of cesium bromide. We just put a small coating of cesium bromide at that tip of the burner. And when a compound containing phosphorus is burnt, alkali metals are released because cesium bromide will uh, decompose giving you CCM ions that is alkali metal ion and um, these alkali metals ionizes and increases the current flow. That means, we can increase the sensitivity of the phosphorus substances by incorporating the CCM bromide which will increase the current and therefore, the detectability detection limit goes up to 10 raise to minus 12 grams and uh, phosphorus compounds can be analyzed in this way because most, most of the insecticides and pesticides and uh, fertilizers especially in the storm water drains and, uh, uh, and in the plants metabolites all these uh, substances need to be analyzed only in this range about 10 raise to minus 12 grams. So, the unfortunately the LDR that is linear dynamic range for phosphorus detector is only about 1000 that is 10 raise to 3 compared to 10 raise to 6 of TCD, 10 raise to 7 of FID etcetera. But um, the detector is useful for the determination of phosphate additives in gasoline and pesticides also. That is very important because we do not have very simple methods for the separation of phosphate additives in gasoline and pesticides. Now, I would like to discuss with you another kind of detector that is known as electron capture detector. This is based on the electron capture by compounds having affinity for free electrons. Now, the idea is we have to generate free electrons and these free electrons need to be need to be attracted by the cathode and uh, uh, the during the process it causes the loss of signal due to recombination phenomena. For example, as the nitrogen carrier gas flows through the detector, the we are using the nickel uh, 63 or a tritium source and we pass the carrier gas through the detector element that is nickel 63 or tritium gas and uh, beta particles from a tritium source ionize the nitrogen molecules that is carrier gas molecules are ionized and they form in, in turn slow electro slow moving electrons are formed. These slow moving electrons migrate to the anode under a fixed potential I can always fix a potential and try to attract them and um, uh, the potential can be varied from 2 to 100 volts and generate a currents of about 10 raise to minus 8 to 10 raise to minus 9 amperes that is the base current. Now, you can uh, this is the general arrangement of an electron capture detector. You can see here gas inlet is here and then I have a uh, radioactive foil here and that is uh, 10 milli curie of nickel 63 metal element and the whole size is about one fourth and one, one half that is about three fourth of an inch and uh, the height is also about half an inch maximum the detector size itself is approximately about one, uh, one inch or 1 1.5 inches. So, the when the gas inlet is there the here there is a detector and then um, grounding and all other paraphernalia would be there and as the carrier gas comes in as the gas comes in the um, 
the uh, electrons are captured by the components and reach the anode and the excess gas will flow out through this uh, opening and uh, the whole thing is insulated and uh, this is known as pin cup design and uh, here I have put A is tritium foil here the typical arrangement of this ray of this uh, area is like this that is I have a here that is tritium foil B is a small gauge and C is the uh, anode and D is the cathode that is the outlet and E is the plasma ring. So, this is the schematic diagram I can either have a pulse interval like this applied um, uh, the signal would lo look like this if I have a pulsed interval pickup or it can be in the pulse sampling mode I can do it like this and then collect the signal like this and uh, in a reproducible manner. So, this is uh, the electronic capturing solution solute emerges from the column it will pass through a low energy free electron moving area the solute will react with an electron to form a negative molecular ion if the solute reacts with an electron it will acquire negative energy. So, uh, negative charge and then it can form either a negative molecular ion or a neg neutral radical or a negative ion any of these three are possible. Since these ions move very slowly compared to free electrons, free electrons do not have any mass. So, the free electrons would be moving much faster compared to these molecular ions or a neutral radical or a negative ion etcetera. So, a reduction in the net current occurs which is proportional to its concentration that is a very simple uh, way of putting the theoretical basis of the separation the current generated it can be expressed in this form I is equal to I 0 into the e to the power of uh, minus k x into c where k is a constant depending upon the field strength and c is the absorption cross section of the vapor x is a geometric factor I 0 is the initial current and I is the final current. So, it is a, the reduction would be always less than I 0 and um, uh, it can be quantified using this approximate uh, equation. Now, the ECD can be operated either in pulsed mode or a cons or under a constant voltage as I had shown you in the previous uh, slide that is uh, here this is uh, constant uh, applied uh, pulse interval I can measure at exact intervals or I can make it pulse sampling mode and uh, the um, advantage is it is a um, pulsed current or a simple signal. So, ECD is extremely sensitive to organic and inorganic halogen compound containing compounds because halogen compounds have a an affinity for the electrons. Uh, and uh, they can form negative ions and all those uh, possibilities are there. Similarly, hydroxides can also capture the electrons, peroxides yes, conjugated carbonyl compounds yes. Similarly, nitrites, nitrates, ozone, oxygen and uh, organometallic compounds, sulfur containing compound all these things can be separated and uh, sensed using the electron capture detectors, but it is insensitive to hydrocarbons because hydrocarbons do not have the affinity to capture an electron and form a negative ion. Similarly, 
amines they cannot be um, they ca do not have the affinity for the electrons ketones same problem and pesticides and organometallic uh, organometallics in gasoline they are the better candidates for the general application of such substances therefore the ecd is only a specially required um, detector which you will have to specify when you buy a gas chromatograph so it is it is not that you should have all the all types of uh, um, the detectors but you will depending upon the type of work you are planning you can go for tcd or fid or gas density detector or um, phosphorus detectors or electron capture detectors like that and then you will have to choose among these detectors whichever is most suitable for your applications and then buy those things and they will be factory fitted onto the instrument whenever you buy the equipment so it is a very important concept of uh, uh, choosing a detector especially depending upon your work requirement in general research institutions would go for tcd and fid that will suffice for most of their applications research institutes etc but there are dedicated industries for example pesticide industries and then environmental laboratories they would like to go for uh, fid tcd and then electron capture detector depending upon the type of sample they want to separate and analyze so there are other detectors also for example there is a flame emission detector and then conductivity detector if the sample is able to conduct um, the electricity through the ions then uh, we have conductivity detectors then we can have rf discharge detectors then i can simply connect an infrared spectrometer to the end of the column of a gas chromatography uh, column and then i can call it gcfi uh, gcir and then gcms i can connect mass spectrometry to gc then i have a hyphenated technique known as gcms similarly other uh, uh, detectors can be custom made provided you have that kind of applications in the mind but i am not going into details of these uh, detectors because um, they are all driven by specific requirement of the chemical analysis and the type of sample what you would like to handle so that completes our discussion on the detectors but um, i would uh, like to say that as another part of the uh, instrumentation of uh, uh, gas chromatography it is important to have a recorder the recorder should be generally of about 10 millivolts full scale fitted with a fast response pen nowadays uh, the response pen should be uh, correspond to should correspond to 1 second or less but uh, the recorder should be connected with a series of good quality resistances connected across the input to attenuate the large signals so you, whenever you get a very large signal it must be attenuated and then um, it should be recorded and uh, you can add an integrator to determine the total area of a um, signal that is also a must nowadays what is happening is most of the signals are recorded on the computer and you can take a print out and uh, the computer uh, recording is much more simpler because uh, most of these things are already incorporated features can already be incorporated including the peak area measurement integration and then quantity quantitation followed by um, the estimations and um, statistical evaluation all those things are possible if you are able to connect it to a computer so again in most of the modern instruments microprocessor is a forms a microprocessor forms a very important component in almost all these 
uh, equipments and uh, recording is no exception. So, the um, other part of the gas chromatography, uh, gas chromatographic equipment is the thermal compartment that is the big box that uh, um, what I would uh, I would say that the whole uh, comp the whole gas chromatographic equipment should be put in a big box and the uh, everything has to be controlled precisely to plus or minus 0.1 degree centigrade and that is uh, the column should be controlled injection block should be controlled column O 1 should be controlled and then detection detector units must be controlled and um, all these things must be controlled up to 0.1 degree centigrade accuracy. Maximum operating temperature for example, in gas chromatography also is a very important concept because many of the organic substances uh, what you are using for coating the column they will start decomposing. So, there is always a limit to which your gas chromatographic uh, uh, analysis uh, can be taken that far. So, that temperature is about 500 degree centigrade. So, therefore, separate heaters for each the column injection block and column oven and detector etcetera, they you need separate heaters for maintaining the temperature and also to have a rapid heating protocols. So, that is a must. Uh, therefore, sometimes what happens is the moment you take out a sample again when everything is heated you cannot inject another sample. So, you need to cool the whole system. So, rapid cooling is also essential for multiple operations. So, that is the function of the thermal compartment. Now, let us discuss a little about the gas chromatographic theory um, because um, it is generally we have discussed this in the initial stages, but with respect to gas chromatography we have not discussed and um, the gas chromatographic theory actually uh, covers complex interactions of all the variables, but a brief treatment of the basic parameters we can consider and uh, one of them is retention behavior. The retention behavior is again a function of the carrier gas flow rate and the operating temperature. The retention time also can be for any component for a given column is a constant. So, on the chromatogram the distance on the time axis from the sample injection to the peak of the eluted component is called uncorrected retention time. You would see most of it um, as the anchor you will see a small air signal whenever you see a gas chromatograph and from there you can calculate the uh, retention times. Now, this slide will show you that uh, the retention time is uh, defined by V r that is a function of T r and F c. F c is the gas flow rate and T r is the retention time. Now, these are the ionized uh, idealized elution peaks. Here is you can see that this is an air peak and this is V r dash and this is where the peak is coming and this is the V r another for another component third component etcetera and effluent is usually split into two parts. So, that delta m 1 and bar delta m 2 and delta m 2 bar delta 1 m 1 should be equal, because in this case there is some amount of mixing of the two peaks. So, this kind of separation are not very ideal. So, uh, ideal would be like this, this part. So, this is the volume or time axis and this is the concentration of solute in the effluent that is the y axis. Now, gas flow rate must be corrected to the column temperature and outlet temperature P. It is very important because we are we have to remember that we are doing with the 
we are dealing with the gas. So, the temperature also must be uh, related to the pressure. So, temperature and pressure must be correlated. The air spike usually measures the transit time for a non retained substance. So, converted to volume V m, it represents basically the interstitial volume of the gaseous phase in the column plus the effective volume contribution of the injector port and detection uh, detector, detection unit or detector whatever it is. Here I have written detection. So, the v, therefore, we write V r dash that has to be corrected for the dead space. How do you do that? That is T r into F c minus T air into F c. So, in general that means we are basically correcting the volume. So, you can represent it as V r minus V m. Since the usually the gas moves more slowly near the inlet than at the exit column, this is a very standard uh, observation. So, a pressure gradient correction or a compressibility factor j must be applied to V r dash that is to this uh, volume to get the net retention volume. So, we write V n is equal to that is the net retention volume V n is given by a compressibility factor multiplied by V r dash, where j is given by this number 3 by 2 into p i by p 0 whole square divided by minus 1 divided by p 0 by p 0 whole raised to 3 minus 1. Now, you can see that V r into C m is equal to V m into C m plus V s into C s. This we have discussed in the first uh, class on the chroma, uh, first class in of the chromatographic separations. So, you can write V r is equal to V m into V m plus k d into V s where we incorporate the partition coefficient. Now, we can also write k d into V s is equal to V r minus V m in that should be equal to k d into W l divided by rho l and uh, this W l actually represents the weight of the liquid phase and rho l is the density of the liquid phase. We can calculate V g that is specific retention volume for a any substance and that is given by 273 rho l. Now, we are in uh, we are involving the density of the substance and uh, multiplied by k d by T c where k d is given by this expression. So, we can actually calculate the actual uh, the separation uh, retention volume based on the density as well as partition coefficient as related to T c. So, the temperature dependence is again a very important concept because uh, I would uh, like to say that uh, it has something to do with the enthalpy. So, the uh, enthalpy can be related to V g that is uh, according to this ex expression if we write uh, in the slide log V g is given by enthalpy uh, divided by 2.3 r into T c plus it is a uh, some constant we have to incorporate and uh, where in this equation delta H is the partial molar heat of the solute in the liquid phase. So, we can plot log V g into rho L versus 1 over T c. If you plot log V g versus 1 over T c, the remaining part delta H upon 2.3 r is obtained as a slope of the equation and which is should be a linear function. Therefore, lower operating temperature normally leads to increased retention time. You reduce the temperature, the you reduce the temperature, the substances will be held in the column for longer time. So, is there a um, benchmark? The benchmark is every 30 degree centigrade reduction will double the retention time approximately not exactly for all compounds, 
but in general whenever we run a gas chromatograph you are interested in retaining the column because support material if you remember when we discussed the columns they all contain liquid substances coated on to solid inorganic supports like uh, diatomaceous earth, kisel, gur, etcetera. If you operate at higher temperature, then what happens? Many of the substances that are coated will also evaporate and the concentration of the liquid phase that is stationary phase will come down. Therefore, it is always preferable to operate a gas chromatograph at as low temperature as possible, but how much low? So, the depending upon the importance of the component, importance of the liquid phase and importance of the um, of the speed of analysis, you should always work out uh, whether you would like to have a longer retention time or shorter retention time. And if you want to have a longer retention time, approximate uh, uh, idea can be obtained by reducing the retention time that is reducing the temperature by about 30 degrees will double the reaction time. So, a knowledge of uh, enthalpy and V g in general it helps in calculating the order in which the peaks will emerge. For example, below 67 degree centigrade if I take a look at the enthalpy and V g of these two substances, methyl cyclopentane will come out first and 2, 4 dimethylpentane will come out next. Now, higher than 67 degree centigrade if I maintain the column temperature, what I get is the order will get reversed that is 2, 4 dimethyl cyclopentanone will come first and methyl cyclopentane will come later that is also possible. Now, I would like to say a few words about the relative retention time. The relative retention time is expressed as a uh, the ratio of the retention time with respect to a standard, because whenever you want to separate any compound of unknown character, you should always do separation with a known substance whose retention time is known, so that you can standardize all parameters with respect to the known standard and then you can try to correlate the unknown uh, separations. So, I would like to write an expression something like this that is alpha is equal to T r dash divided by T r dash multiplied by the standard T r dash of the standard material that can be written as K d 2 divided by K d 1 because all other substance all other terms will vanish because if I have only the sample and standard there will be only these two terms will remain. So, alpha is basically independent of the column length and then it is independent of the carrier gas flow rate, it is independent of the compressibility factor and liquid solid support ratio etcetera. So, especially when you want to express relative retentions then you should go for uh, this kind of ratios. So, I can have retentions for various solute classes uh, tabulated for typical stationary phases. For a given stationary phase, I can pass through a uh, number of uh, uh, number of substances belonging to the same category. For example, methane, pentane, butane, hexane, nonane all such substances belong to one class that is known as hydrocarbons. And these hydrocarbons if I pass through a known column, a single column and then try to compare, then I can have a database of how the samples will behave. So, retention times for various solute classes like this alcohols, hydrocarbons, ketones, aldehydes etcetera, they are tabulated for typical stationary phases which helps in estimating whether a mixture can be separated or not. 
if I know the relative retention time for each compound. So, if I have a suspicion of the compounds what I have in my sample, uh, all I have to do is take a look at the relative standard retention times and form a plan how I can separate my mixture. So, the tabulated um, typical stationary phases in general help in estimating whether a mixture can be separated or not in the first place. And then if it can be separated, how do we go about doing the separation? So, such uh, tabulations are usually found in journal of chromatographic science, journal of gas chromatography, several other uh, chromatographic dedicated uh, journals for chromatography are there. Then, then there is chromatography review also is there and then several textbooks on gas chromatography, they also give you lot of information with respect to these uh, uh, substances that is the relative retention times. Now, there is a something known as Covatt's retention index. Now, this Covatt's retention index basically it relates the isothermal data that is retention volume to those of n paraffins that is uh, n uh, paraffins containing n number of carbon atoms that is different carbon atoms eluting directly before the sample. So, the index is given by 100 into n where n is the number of carbon atoms in a given sample. So, uh, expanded uh, uh, on a Rx scale that is 100 i into log Rx minus log Rn this thing etcetera. The, this index is um, Rx, Rn and Rn plus 1 are the retentions of unknowns, paraffins of carbon atom n, carbons, uh, paraffins containing carbon n number of carbon atoms and paraffins containing n plus i number of carbon atoms. Therefore, it is a carbon n retention relationship that means, number of carbons relation uh, retention times based on these things. So, you can have some sort of a plot like this uh, based on the retention index. You can see here all these are the uh, numbers which are retention times from a tricresyl phosphate uh, column and this is for alcohols, this is for ketones, this is for aldehydes, esters, cyclohexanes, alkanes and then um, here at the bottom I have listed alcohols, ketones, aldehydes, esters, cycloalkanes and alkanes etcetera. And uh, these uh, having these uh, figures will help me in analyzing an unknown substance from, uh, uh, from a given mixture. So, if I know the Covatt's retention index, I will know what should be the temperature, how long it will be held, what should be my column temperature, oven temperature and other things because uh, the, there are several data available based on Covatt's retention index, what would be the optimum uh, parameters for their separation from a given mixture. Now, what are the, let us discuss a little about the applications of gas chromatography. So far we have discussed about the instrumentation and then uh, theoretical basis, but uh, the average um, discussion on gas chromatography will never be complete without the applications, because the uh, applications are as va varied as numerous as the gas chromatographs themselves. Actually, there are millions of gas chromatographs all over the world and daily millions of compounds are being analyzed by gas chromatography. So, it is a very, very important component in any analytical science laboratory. So, there is something known as the um, optimum utilization of a given instrument. So, if a substance is given to you in a ready made form, 
ready made mixture and you know how to separate jo job is done and well and good. But there are sometimes uh, situations where you would like to um, separate the components not only on their own as they emerge from the column, but also you would like to tinker with the chemical properties of the substances which you want to separate. Now, these uh, thing, such uh, reactions, the small uh, uh, additions which you can uh, small tricks you can say that small tricks which you can handle in a gas chromatography are uh, the things which make gas chromatography so much versatile in the end. Therefore, let us uh, I want to talk to you about reaction gas chromatography. Actually, in the reaction gas chromatography, the injected substances pass through a small reaction zone ahead of the column or within the injection port or inside a column or post column also. Basically, the idea is to pass the sample through a zone in which some certain reactions are ensured and the products are coming out, different products are coming out which can be sensed depending upon the requirement. Now, you can see that the, um, there are different kinds of reactions one can carry out inside a gas chromatograph. For example, this is subtractive process. If you have straight chain alkanes and then cyclic alkanes and branched alkanes, all the three are you are having a mixture and you would like to separate them. The best thing is to have a column of molecular sieve of 5 angstrom molecular sieve, then all these things can be separated. I have put one example of hexane, heptane and octane which is to be separated around 268 degree centigrade and then hexane is not absorbed from a mixture of hexane, heptane and octane. So, only hexane will come out if you carry out the separation using this. Now, imagine that you have a mixture of olefins and aromatics. Olefins are ethylenic compounds and uh, aromatics are uh, aromatic compounds anyway you know more about it. So, if, if they can be separated pass through a column containing 20 percent mercuric sulphate in 20 percent hydro sulfuric acid through a small reaction zone only aromatics will come out olefins will get absorbed they will not come out. So, your separation is achieved you can quantitatively estimate and many other uh, things can be done. Uh, once you can pass it through the solution, once without solution you can estimate both. Similar things uh, tricks we employ in gas chromatography. We will continue our discussions in the next class.